What's going on guys, it's Frito here for your Overwatch. It's Tuesday and that means it's patch day. We got a bunch of interesting hero changes to shake up the metagame and our first glimpse at Overwatch 2 PvE, sorta. The Star Watch game mode goes live today. And it's kind of like a Titanfall 1 PvP versus PvE. It repurposes Horizon Lunar Colony and makes a alternate timeline space opera for the Overwatch characters and is one of these event skin game modes that they keep making. The setting of the map in this alternate universe is darker than the normal Overwatch aesthetic, which normally is a bright, optimistic, hopeful future. Star Watch is more Darth Vader. The gameplay is 4v4 attackers and defenders, and the attackers need to cap 4 points. You can revive your allies when they go down, and the defenders get to utilize turrets and extra tricks. This new game mode will be live from today, May 9th through the 22nd, and you can earn a free Wrecking Ball skin, charm, and more. Now let's get on to the patch notes. Some of these first ones are kind of light, so I'm going to breeze right past them. The Battle for Olympus game mode has returned. An important change to the ping system. The contextual ping, when you hit group up or need healing, used to give alternate comms when looking at allies. That's now set to off, and you can turn it back on in the options if you want. I don't think I will because I don't like hitting group up and it's saying I'm with you. Always felt kind of odd, considering I want them to come back to me. The push game mode gets an interesting change. The respawn on time for players is increased by two seconds. It was 10 seconds as it is with every game mode outside of overtime. Now it's 12 seconds, at least while their team's forward spawn location is activated. This is intended to make it easier to make a comeback because teams that already have an advanced position and forward spawns were able to camp that advantage easier, especially when the respawn times were even. So now there'll be a bit of a downside to being in the lead, although not a huge one. As always, they mention matchmaking improvements. The MMR decay system has received multiple improvements aimed at more quickly and accurately recalibrating players when they return from a long period of inactivity. We're not going to overanalyze what this is or could mean because they've done this so many times. Competitive deathmatch will begin on May 16th if you're interested in alternate competitive game modes. Now let's get into talking about the hero changes. Junker Queen gets a very big redistribution of power. The scatter gun maximum ammo has been increased from six to eight shots and the jagged blades projectile size has increased from 0.15 to 0.2 meters so a lot chunkier on the jagged blade making it easier to land rampage now deals 40 impact damage and the wound damage has decreased though from 100 to 60 which gives it more damage up front and less damage over time but the same overall in total which i think even makes sense from just a visuals perspective perspective, seeing as she's spinning around blades that hit you, and her passive Adrenaline Rush, which heals her when she applies wounds. The Adrenaline Rush passive healing multiplier has increased from 0.25 to two times damage dealt by wounds, which seems like a massive increase, but remember every time we've talked about Junker Queen patches, we're talking about numbers in the teens, which definitely matter and especially matters more. In this patch, Junker Queen's getting straight up buff. The next change is to Orisa, the augmented fusion driver damage has increased from 12 to 13. The devs say Orisa often gets a lot of value with her abilities, but she is underperforming compared to other tanks. Increasing her weapon damage will make her more of an immediate threat after closing the distance with the enemy team. The big nerf Orisa got was to her range damage, where at one point she was really able to follow up on her spear from range with her damage. Now, she's really only effective at closer range. That still probably is going to be the case but this added damage will help her finish off targets more easily in that effective range. Interesting that they're buffing Winston's jetpack. The damage radius before falloff begins is increased from 1 to 1.3 meters. A pretty significant range increase considering it's basically a melee type ability. The devs say it's difficult to deal full damage with Winston's leap due to needing to land almost directly on the enemy hero. Increasing this range will improve its consistency. It also means you'll be hitting more targets with it and just dealing more damage altogether, increasing Winston's Primal Rage build rate, which is one of the most important aspects of the character. Wrecking Ball gets an adaptive shield nerf. The effect duration has decreased from 9 seconds to only 7. The devs say adaptive shields gives Wrecking Ball a lot of leeway in a fight due to its duration. This change to adaptive shields limits his survivability during prolonged engagements. 
Also note, Ana's sleep dart duration got decreased, so this nerf helps kind of close the gap with that to mean that the shield uptime will be reduced to the same total amount when the sleep dart is hit. And overall, with the shield only lasting 7 seconds instead of 9, Wrecking Ball's ability to go in, farm shields, and go back in with extra shield health has a much smaller window altogether, and ignoring Wrecking Ball is going to be more effective than before, as he really isn't scary once the shields are worn off. Onto the damage category, Echo's duplicate ultimate cost has been reduced by 25%, and ultimate generation decreased from 5.5 to only 4 times while duplicate is active. The devs say the following changes increase the flexibility of Echo's duplicate ultimate and shift some of the focus away from the allure of building multiple copied ultimates in a single use. This puts more emphasis on choosing a duplicate target based on the hero's overall utility for a given situation situation with the benefit of increased survivability due to transforming. Echo will get her ultimate more frequently, but it'll be more difficult to generate the copied hero's ultimate. In the situations where you don't build an ultimate currently will be even more difficult to generate. You'll feel starved for that ult charge. So longer building ultimates like maybe Zarya might be a little difficult to farm with the new change, perhaps even tanks in general. And then on the other side, ults like Tracer's Pulse Bomb, which farm incredibly fast and duplicate form, they still will, but you won't maybe get the third pulse bomb as a potential high-end peak. I think that getting more Echo ultimates up and out and up sooner than other ultimates makes the ult more interesting and powerful, because getting it slower means you're more often going to need a very specific interaction to be able to counteract the enemy's ults, whereas gaining earlier tempo on them means your options for what is a good dupe are more wide open, and it's more likely that it's going to to have an effective carry potential on the fight if the enemy doesn't have their own ults to correspond with yours. There's a lot of zoning ults in the game that I think utterly shut down Echo's duplicate in its current form, or requires you to pick something defensive from the enemy, which won't help you clear the enemy off the point, which often like neutrals out what the ult does, as opposed to creating a carry impact and wiping the enemy. Junkrat gets a buff where the maximum damage has been increased on his concussion mine. It was nerfed down to 100. Now they found a middle point where the concussion mine will do 110 damage. The developers say the previous adjustment Adjustments to Concussion Mine's maximum damage lowered the effectiveness of Junkrat's grenade and mine combos too much, so we are increasing the damage amount slightly. Remember, a direct hit with a nade does 120, and the most important thing about the mine damage number is that it has damage fall off outside of its closest range. So if it starts at a higher number, that means there's a bigger effective range where you'll do the minimum required damage, 80, to combo to one-shot kill a squishy. Also, to kind of of override any little bit of healing that they sometimes get in between the combo landing. Onto the support changes, Ana gets a nerf. Biotic Grenade's explosion healing has decreased from 100 to 60. The developers say Ana's survivability has improved significantly ever since the addition of the support passive. We are reducing the amount of healing provided by Biotic Grenade explosion as she doesn't need to rely on it for self-healing as much as before. But this changes how much she heals us, her team and especially her tank as well. Ana farms up some of the highest heal stats in the game using effective mutual nades on the enemy's tank and your own. In the kaiju battles, heal nade I've been saying since the launch of the game is pretty underrated considering it was kind of useless in Overwatch 1. Baptiste gets a small buff where the immortality field's cooldown has decreased from 25 to 23 seconds. The devs say immortality field provided powerful utility, but its long cooldown means that Baptiste often has to wait for the perfect opportunity to use it. Not sure how that changes with two seconds, but we're decreasing its cooldown slightly to promote more flexibility in usage, though it will still be uncommon to see it more than once per engagement. Batista is one of my strongest supports in Overwatch 2, and as a Grandmaster support player, I can tell you, I don't wait for the perfect opportunity to use this. It's immortality. Just give it at the first sight of trouble. Don't try to overly set it up, though it's even more powerful when you do. With how the game works, enemies often don't outplay the field well enough, or if they commit onto you, think they're winning, use cooldowns to get there, it's not like they can just escape out of the fight, so I suggest you use it earlier rather than later, regardless of what the devs say here. Honestly, I think Batiste is one of those characters that is just less popular than the likes of Ana, and they've always been just as powerful, but they keep shifting power away from one to the other, and I think that might be a bit of a mistake, because 
the objective balance I think is different and it's more so just like community perception, feel, familiarity. That seems to matter a lot with the way Overwatch 2's performance stats have been going. And I hope they don't keep just like curbing it to force a different result just to make win rates a little more even or something. Change to Kiriko. Kunai reload after 65% of the animation where it used to be 75. This is important because you switch between healing and damaging. And if you don't fully complete or like three quarters of the way complete the animation, you're going to not have ammo when you go back to those kunais. Well, now that's a little better at 65%. This may have been a lesson that they were thinking about more critically when thinking about the new hero, Life Weaver, who is horrible for this as well. There's also a new hero option. Healing a Fuda cancels reload. The devs explain this in saying Kiriko sometimes accidentally interrupts her kunai reload with a Fuda. Kunai now reloads slightly sooner during the animation to mitigate this. In addition, there is now a hero option. Healing a Fuda cancels reload, which can be turned off to bypass this issue entirely. However, I wouldn't suggest you use this because I don't think you want your healing downtime to be increased just so you fully reload your weapon, which has a high capacity anyway. Usually there's time to reload and you don't really necessarily run out of ammo. It's just more so the switching mechanic that gets annoying. But if you really want, you could turn that off. Change to Life Weaver. Life Grip. Reinhardt is no longer a valid target for Life Grip during Earth Shatter and using Earth Shatter will cancel Life Grip. The devs say Earth Shatter is an ultimate where positioning is critical to effectively use. So we are adjusting it so Reinhardt doesn't have their ultimate be effectively canceled when Life Weaver uses Life Grip. Remember, this is a small change in a series of changes that we discussed in a previous video where Aaron Keller went in depth to say that there was a bigger Life Weaver rework coming in season five, possibly a new passive and new utility added onto his abilities. For now, I think it's a pretty big consensus among high level players, at least from what I've heard, that Life Grip has a huge problem with it that accidentally canceling your big cooldown ability is just no good for the value of a hero. There's no way to cancel getting Suzu'd on accident, right? And here with this change, they're giving another movement style ability that's gonna break the bubble of giving a teammate an extra life. I guess they want the playability of being able to land your shatter without being griefed, but more often than not, the clips that I see are feeding Reinhardt's that most definitely were going to die, getting pulled back and yeah, losing their ability, but keeping their life, which is a little tricky for support players point of view because not having a tank when you are a more supportive style support is quite annoying as you need them to make decent plays to be able to farm value off of them. We'll have to see if that more solo queue friendly or even high level competitive friendly aspect comes to Life Weaver in the new rework work coming next season. The devs made a massive quality of life pass against all the heroes. I'm not going to go through them all here because the patch notes are kind of incredibly long. For the most part, it's about hiding text, changing UI, few quality of life fixes to make the game feel more playable here and there. Bastion will cast his ult at the end of the timer. You can change your echo focusing beam to be hold instead of just press, needing to press again to cancel it. I might actually turn that one on since it's better to allow focusing beam to go on cooldown as soon as possible. That's what the pros do. Get its peak damage and then available sooner to do peak damage again as opposed to doing the 50 damage per second. A similar change to Reaper's Wraith form where you hold it to use it or release in order to come out of Wraith. And a long list of bug fixes as always. If one of those you think were a big one that the community was worried about, let us know in the comment section down below. From reading it, I don't know if there's any major ones that are balance changing. But that's everything for today's video. If you guys did enjoy it, please be sure to leave the video with a like and don't forget to subscribe and click the bell icon to actually get notified when our videos come out. That's been it for me. I've been Frito for your Overwatch. I'll see you guys next time.